Leia Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry. Hello and welcome to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. Folks, on this week's show, I wanted to focus on your gut, not your gut instinct or going with your gut, but more importantly, gut health. It's a topic I've covered before on this show, but for this episode, I wanted to focus on bloating, reflux, constipation, and all the gut health myths that are out there. We're going to pick 10 of them and talk through them. There are issues a lot more common than you think, but many people suffering from all of these ailments. So to find out more and to get some advice on how to best deal with them, I'm delighted to be joined by Lorraine Meyer, a specialist gastroenterology dietitian with the Black Rock Clinic. Lorraine, welcome to Real Health. How are you? I'm great, thank you. Thank it's you for the podcast. It's great to have you on. This is a fascinating topic. Every month we see more and more content being pushed out there in terms of social media, in terms of in the papers around gut health. And I thought someone like yourself would be perfect to talk us through the kind of 10 common myths that are there around gut health and what people really should be doing, what works and what doesn't work. Because there is a lot of myths out there, isn't there? Absolutely. Gut health is a mega trend now, but with trends comes a lot of um, legit information, but a lot of misinformation. So that's why I think this is uh, going to be a good conversation. Okay, well, listen, let's get cracking. Let's get stuck into it. So I want to let's kick it off with IBS. Uh, what is it, first and foremost? Uh, and let's chat through it. Yes, IBS is defined as a chronic relapsing gastrointestinal problem, and it's characterized by abdominal pain. So you should have abdominal pain if you have IBS. And you also probably have other symptoms like bloating or gas and a change in your bowel habit. Um, It's estimated that maybe one in 10 people fit and meet this criteria for having IBS. Um, And... But to get your diagnosis, you may have to go through a raft of investigations and rule out things like celiac disease because it may be overlapping symptoms. Um, But it is chronic in that it probably is a long-term condition and relapsing, it may have periods where symptoms are bad and then they might disappear or need to come back out of the blue again. um, So it's about learning to manage this condition, but you just don't have to put up with it. I think the old kind of saying it's it's in your head or put up with it aren't true anymore like the definition i suppose um what we would say evolves over time and now scientists and experts believe that it's a dysregulation of the gut brain microbiome access meaning that's That's a big term give give me that one again that sounds quite nice (laughs) so the gut brain access is the bi-directional communication between your gut and your brain so think of it as like um a super highway of of traffic going up and down and that's the communication. Somehow they believe there's um, something wrong with that super highway and that maybe like there's a traffic jam or roadworks and the messages aren't going up and down as they normally would. So it's not nobody's fault that they have IBS or they didn't cause IBS or what they're eating didn't cause IBS. Um, So there's no guilt um, needed. Um, It's just um, a functional um, issue in that the function of your gut isn't working. But I think that um, for people who have IBS and know that there's a whole raft of evidence-based interventions you can use to manage it. And you don't have to put all your eggs in the diet basket, but there's lots of things that you can do. So you don't feel that you're on your own and you don't have to put up with that. And let's chat about bowel habits then. So how aware should people be of their bowel habits? I can see, I can hear all my listeners getting kind of nervous and and, and, and kind of touchy as they bring this up, but it is really important. And presumably we all have individual bowel habits around timings, around maybe stool types and stuff like that. Absolutely. Yeah, there's something that your listeners can look up called the Bristol stool chart form. Um, It's um, the gruesome pictures uh, of different stool types and they're basically categorised. So you've got seven types. Type one and two are considered more constipated. Type three, four, five are more normal and six and seven are more in the diarrhea spectrum. So looser bowel movements. So you kind of want to be in the three, four and five. And frequency then is also important. So if you're not passing a bowel motion, greater than three times a week or you're passing a bowel motion greater than three times a day they're kind of like the um the levels of where you're normal and abnormal but everyone is completely different and what's normal for you is your norm but if you're a little bit outside the spectrum there then maybe you have an issue i think one of the greatest things that people think they have an issue with it would be um bloating because it's such a common symptom but a little bit of bloating can be normal so we we can all have a little bit of bloating now and again that doesn't have to be pathological as in it can't doesn't have to be medically recognized as having something wrong with you 
So for example, if you had a meal from a Mexican with a lot of beans or you had pizza and beer um, or you had a very rich meal, you might feel bloated for a few hours after. But that's just normal. That's just your your digestive system in action, your gut bacteria breaking down the food. And after a couple of hours, it will subside. And by morning, you'll be, you'll be normal again. But if you have bloating, that is persistent, chronic as in longer than six months, you, you know, your clothes are uncomfortable by the end of the day, you're just, you feel discomfort and you have pain, then maybe that's a chat that you'd have with your GP. Okay, so again, a little bit of bloating is normal. And is it true to say there's certain foods for certain people that will cause more bloating than other foods? And if so, what would the regular foods be? Yeah, so you have to kind of look at it not just food alone, but eating behavior would be one of the first things I would look at. So how fast you eat your food. So if you're a fast eater and gulp down your food, you're not chewing your food and you're probably um, adding air down into your gut. So that would worsen bloating. So slowing down the rate of eating. Also the portion size of your meals is really important. So reducing the portion size of your meals can make a big impact on bloating. Um, also, um, like foods in terms of what would be common culprits, maybe lactose or what we call polyols, which are like in sugar-free products, such as like mints or, or I don't know, like chocolates or sweets or things like that, these kind of um, ingredients. Um, and you can go down a spectrum of food restrictions, but um, you just do that with, um, with some caution because it's not just about whittling down your diet and excluding lots of foods to reduce the bloating. You have to kind of look at the bigger picture. Activity is important as well. And something that has to be mentioned is that gut brain axis again. So the stress element, humans are very bad at recognizing stress and how to deal with stress because we live in such a frantic world and we're living in a pandemic. There's always, you know, there's something that we tend to overlook that. In fact, like over 70% of people in who attend my clinic would admit that stress triggers gut symptoms. And yet only about 10% would actively do something in terms of a relaxation practice or to, to chill out really on a day-to-day basis. So that side of things can be overlooked. So um, yes, food can be a culprit for um, bloating, but so can eating behavior, stress, lack of activity, wearing too tight of clothes. So there's a lot of components. Okay, great. So the next myth we're going to chat about is beans. Beans have a bad rap in terms of gut health. A lot of people will avoid them, but actually they can be really good. Oh yeah, a lot of the evidence would show that beans, because they're a whole grain, would have health properties in terms of being protective for our body. Um, But they get a bad rap for two reasons. One is because of the lectin content. So this is a little bit of fear-mongering, fear-based food messaging, which is all the rage at the moment. So making people afraid of certain foods because they're toxic. So there's not really justification for that. There's a couple of trials that did look at people who got kind of a food poisoning from eating beans. Um, But if you look deeper, it will show you that it was because the beans were not cooked so uncooked beans yes can maybe give you what would be similar to food poisoning so if you ate an uncooked um, kidney bean you probably would feel quite sick but when you eat the kidney bean from a tin you're absolutely fine and that's because the canning process denatures the lectin to make it perfectly fine um, other times beans, yeah, well, we all know the, the, the rhyme of beans, beans are good for your heart. So a lot of beans may produce increased flatulence or wind or bloating. And that's because of um, something called a fermentable carbohydrate. Again, you don't have to avoid beans completely, but if you use tinned beans and rinse them, they're typically better tolerated or you just look at the portion that you're having. So portion size is important, but they're great to have in your diet beans because of all beans and pulses and um, uh, lentils and, and that range of foods um, are particularly um, healthy in terms of the fiber, the prebiotics and the protein content that they have. So. Okay, so get, get more in. You can load up on beans. Fantastic. Yeah, um, what a, tolerance. <laughs> the next tip, let's, and this is an interesting one in terms of a myth, and I, it's something I hear a huge amount from clients, like, you know, I'm going gluten-free because it's far healthier for me. Mm-hmm. Talk me through that. Are they healthier or are they not? So this is a complex question, um, really, because there's a lot of, a lot I can say in this area. But really, it's not really true that gluten-free is healthier, except for those with celiac disease or something called non-celiac gluten sensitivity, where you have to avoid gluten from the diet, so it's harmful for your gut. But really, um, it's not either 
essential or detrimental to have gluten in your diet, but people believe because of strong marketing, like one study showed that 65% of people believe that gluten-free is healthier, but that's not where the science is at. For the general population, if you ate a lot of bread and pasta and muffins and biscuits and went gluten-free, you can choose gluten-free versions of those foods, but they would be less in terms of the overall vitamins and minerals and fiber they would contain. So that's not gaining any health benefit. If you, however, go gluten-free and choose more vegetables and fruits and whole grains and nuts, then you probably will gain some nutritional um, superiority in terms of vitamins, minerals and fibre. And that could be the reason why you're feeling better because you've reduced a lot of the processed foods in your diet. Or also, it may not just be the gluten element, it may be that fermentable carbohydrate element, which is the carbohydrate part of the grain. Um, And that's a different sort of conversation, but it just is also just trying to say that it's not always gluten that's the culprit if you felt better. And something that I find really interesting is something called the nocebo effect to food. So if you believe that a food is going to cause you symptoms, it can actually cause you symptoms without <laughs> And in one trial where they double blinded people, meaning that you don't really know what food component you're eating, and they gave people what they thought was gluten and um, but it wasn't actually gluten. They actually presented with symptoms. And that's no way. And that was 40% in that trial. So there's a lot of components to whether gluten-free is healthier. You may feel better if you avoid it, but keep an open mind as to why you felt better. Was it the change in diet? Was it actually the gluten or another component of the grain? Or was it a belief system? So that's nice to iron out with people um, in my clinic. Um, like that's I do, fascinating. Like, yeah, everyone knows their own body and they know whether they feel better or not. That is valid. But just um, just to know that it's not put into a small little bracket, that this marketing hype, that gluten is toxic and all that. I'm not, not about that at all. And it's fair to say that, you know, if you're going gluten-free, you should be going under the, the advice of a dietitian in terms not- of, you know, it's professional advice to take that product as opposed to just, you know, just choosing it yourself. Yeah. And something else is like when you kind of remove something from your diet, it's always good to replace it. And that's where a dietitian can help, you know, iron that out with you and see suitable alternatives. But there's lots of other whole grains you can have if you want to avoid gluten, such as like potatoes with skins or quinoa or brown rice or whole grain gluten free products, vegetables, fruits, nuts, beans, etc. So you can get a really good diet and still avoid gluten. But if you're not replacing with the whole grains, um, larger studies like there's one in particular with over 300,000 and people that would show that there is an association with increased heart disease if you just avoid whole grains and not replace them you know by by means of avoiding gluten in your diet so um yeah for anybody listening just make wise choices and have other whole grains in your diet if you don't want to eat gluten okay next one up is about probiotics again very topical very trendy uh, i'm dying to hear your opinion on this For the general population, the evidence is not strong enough to say take probiotics to improve your gut health. There's nothing there. There's nothing concrete. And that's because we all have a different microbiome. And the microbiome is the um, combination of all the bacteria, viruses and fungi that reside in your gut, of which there's probably 30 trillion. So enormous kind of ecosystem in your gut. um, and that's what you're putting into your body is these live microorganisms. And if you give them a certain amount, they should come for a health benefit. But what we know is that the strains that are in these probiotics are very, very specific. So for example, if you had a headache, um, you wouldn't use a blood pressure tablet to get rid of the headache. You'd go and find paracetamol. It would be a specific medication. The same kind of analogy or the same should be true for um, probiotics. You, if you have a problem, a gut problem, you should be able to find a trial that showed a specific probiotic was helpful in reducing that good problem. So we can see that in maybe IBS patients, certain probiotics are helpful in reducing gut symptoms or people maybe with ulcerative colitis or diarrhea associated anti, um, antibiotic associated diarrhea. You can take specific, specific strains, like there's thousands of strains. So specific strains means you find that family of uh, bacteria and the name and the number and the the amount of cells that's important and then it's a little bit of trial and error after that <laughs> so because you, everyone has a different microbiome you can react differently to the same probiotic is what i was trying to say there okay. and, and how and how would you fi- how do you find out if that's you know what strain you haven't got or what 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 strain you're missing how does one find that out well you don't you look at the condition 
And then you look at the clinical trial to see did this specific probiotic help reduce symptoms. So if it was an IBS, did it reduce bloating? Um, did it reduce diarrhea? Did it help with constipation? If so, it's maybe worth the trial of that particular specific probiotic. Okay, and fascinating. You give, it for, you give it a trial for one or two months. If you don't notice an effect after two months, then it's probably not... Um, and that was actually my next question was in terms of time frame for seeing improvements. So you're looking at a four to eight week time frame. So don't expect something to happen overnight or within the first seven days. It takes a little longer than that. Yeah. It, again, everyone is just so different. We don't really know. But um, yeah, if you spend your money and take it for a couple of months and then don't notice any benefit, then it's not worthwhile continuing. But if you do notice benefit, then that could be something that is helping you and you can keep in your diet. Okay, great. So give it a little bit of time. Okay, next up, number six, fermented foods helps it help to improve gut symptoms. Again, really trendy. I've seen lots of this in the last 12 months or so. Uh, this is where we pull back to the expert. What's your take on it? So yeah, fermented foods have undergone a huge surge in popularity, uh, mainly because of proposed health benefits associated with them. And I really do think that they're an interesting concept and they've been around for a number of years. And what we can see in test tubes and animal studies is that they can confer health benefits. But human trials are unfortunately lacking. So you can't be gung-ho about them. I do think it's important or you know adequate to include these foods in your diet and don't forget the whole thing of they taste really good and the pleasure of food is really important. It's okay to eat foods that you really enjoy. But in terms of gut symptoms, there's really not much concrete evidence except maybe with kefir, which is a fermented milk. And there's a couple of trials that looked into human trials that are randomized so they would be better quality. And if you have kefir and you suffer with lactose intolerance, um, that you made a better tolerate kefir versus cow's milk. Um, but it would be on a part yogurt, so it's not superior to yogurt. So um, either or um, with that, okay. if you suffer with lactose intolerance, maybe it's worthwhile giving kefir a go. And with H. pylori, which is a, a bacterial infection that you need treatment with antibiotics, those who took kefir alongside the antibiotics had a better response to treatment versus those who didn't. So there's a couple of trials that have come out, and I really anticipate more trials, human trials, in this area because it's really, um, it would be great that they would have a benefit. But just as yet, I couldn't categorically say that have them to improve gut symptoms. Okay, great. Fantastic. Uh, next up, coconut oil. Oh, this is going to be good. Again, very trendy, very kind of very cool over the last kind of 12 to 24 months or so about that it's so good for your gut and it's fantastic. It's almost like an elixir. Not necessarily the case. No, actually coconut oil is high in saturated fat. And I know some people are going down the route of it's high in medium chain triglycerides, but actually that's only about 17% of the coconut oil. So it's not high in medium chain triglycerides. It's actually very high in saturated fat. And physiologically, it probably does the same thing in your gut as animal fat. And what we've seen in the studies is that high animal fat including say coconut oil, would have maybe a negative effect on your microbiome. So that's the trillions of bacteria that live in your gut and would show to increase some of the um, maybe more harmful bacteria. It doesn't mean that you don't have to have, never have coconut oil or animal fat in your diet. It's just that in large amounts that it's probably not conferring any health benefit. And in fact, it could be the opposite. What we do see what may be more helpful is to swap the coconut oil for an unsaturated fat, such as olive oil, nuts, nut oils, avocado, that's where the health benefits seem to be stemming from. Amazing. Okay. I have plenty of olive oil and plenty of cashew nuts in my diet. So that, that makes me feel really good. Um, okay. Number eight. And this is really interesting around food intolerance tests in, in terms of measuring uh, intolerances. How effective are they? So unfortunately, they are not effective. They are not valid. So these, I, particularly these IgG tests, that, um, so that's different from allergies. This is really just to food intolerances. So it's telling you, it measures, what it actually measures is long-term exposure of food. So it's telling you what you eat. And therefore, you'll get a list of foods to avoid, which are the common foods that you eat. And I often meet people in my clinic who have this list, like this like Bible of foods that they have to avoid. And what I see, what it does long term is it instills food fear and anxiety around food. So you're told not to eat these foods because you're intolerant, intolerant to them. And I don't want to feel, make anybody feel bad about this. This is just, it's easy. I understand why you would get one of these tests 
because you want to know why you're not feeling well. And when you reduce foods, you typically feel better. But in the grand scheme of things, what it leads to is long-term restrictive diets, maybe lack of particular nutrients, but that food anxiety or food fear is rife um, over the long term. And I think if people know that they're not legit, it helps them to understand that maybe I don't have to stick to this list of a long list of excluded foods. Maybe I can put some of them back. And that's a healthier approach to your gut health. Okay, brilliant. This is all fascinating. These are really simple. I can, I can hear our listeners writing these things down as they listen in. These are all really common things that they read and they see. And um, the ninth one is another one is around digestive enzymes. So that's a really good fix if you have gut health symptoms. And again, it's not necessarily proven. Yeah, I think this is this is a tricky one. There isn't any evidence to say it. What digestive enzymes, if you take them, you're assuming you have a problem with your pancreas, which is the organ in your body that produces enzymes to digest your carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. But if you buy them in a little bottle and you take them, they're in such small amounts compared to what your body produces. It just doesn't um, add up why it would have a benefit in your gut. I think with this one is the... Again, the, this is the opposite of nocebo, but the placebo effect, you take something that's told to make you feel better and you, you feel better. Um, what we know in practice, as in if there was somebody on the wards here in the hospital who had pancreatic um, disease or surgery, we would give them a prescription with um, comparable amounts of enzymes that your body would produce. Um, and that can help them digest their food. Um, but really, if you take digestive enzymes, they're not economical. You've got a whole raft of digestive enzymes in small amounts. So I'm not really sure what effect it could be occurring. If you did have an issue um, with beans, say, for example, or lactose, you can get individual um, enzymes to help break them down. And it helps for some people. But as over-the-counter digestive enzymes, I just don't see. I don't see. Um, yeah, I can't can't say that they're particularly helpful okay and it's a really common trait all the way through our chat so far there is that note there's no magic quick fix there's no magic solution it takes a little bit of time it takes a little bit of investigation around dietary and lifestyle habits generally to uh-huh. look at issues you know there isn't that over-the-counter kind of magic pill that seems to automatically do it and then the final tip we're going to chat through is again another interesting one around restrictive diets that sometimes you'll see it recommended that certain diets are very good for gut symptoms and they're generally very, very restrictive. But we're not sure that, that that's necessarily good. No, for some people, restrictive diets can help, um, particularly in the realms of, say, um, irritable bowel syndrome, so your IBS or maybe with um, inflammatory bowel disease. But the evidence doesn't show that restrictive diets are good long term. In fact, after four weeks of following some of these restrictive diets, because you avoid a lot of healthy foods that feed your gut bacteria in terms of the fiber component, that it changes your gut bacteria. In this way, it reduces um, the abundance of the beneficial guys down there, such as um, bifidobacteria, which people might have heard of. So if you do a restrictive diet, it's really important that you try and do it only for a short period of time. I would give it about four weeks, restrict some foods. If you feel better, great. The next step, and don't forget the step, is to challenge with the food you avoided. So you can, you know, you can get a dietitian to help um, guide you on this, but you systematically challenge with each food to understand your tolerance. Um, but what we do know is that the best way to improve your gut health is to try and have a diversity of plant-based foods in your diet. So diet diversity, hang on to that, um, this term, because it means that you try and expand the number of plant-based foods, which are all your whole grains, vegetables, fruits, nuts, seeds, and pulses in your diet over a given week. There's a huge um, study called the American Gut Project, which um, sampled over 10,000, no, 11,000, I think, stool samples of people across the world. So that is two samples. <laughs> <It's very laughs> wondering. And they looked at the microbiome, and which, oh, again, all that bacteria that reside in your gut. And those who had over 30 different plant-based foods in their diet per week had the more diverse um, microbiome. So that's all what we're aiming for um, in terms of gut health is to try and improve that diversity of gut bacteria. So food seems to have a profound effect. And in fact, it's the plant-based foods that tend to have the most profound effect. Okay, so uh, Good symptoms, restrict, but only for a short period of time. And the idea is to try and expand long-term. 
Okay, so the very best thing you can do by the sounds of it is eat a very varied plant-based diet. If you can get that magic number 30 over the course of the week, you'll be doing really, really, really well. But that diversion in terms of color and in terms of nutrients seems to be really, really important. Lorraine, that's been fascinating catching up with you. And those 10 lists are so important to get out to our listeners. It's been great to have you on. If people want to contact you or find out more about you, where can they find you? Pleasure. Um, being on your show. Thank you. Um, so I run a gut health clinic in the Black Rock Clinic, so you can look that up um, on Google. I'm also on Instagram, bit of a mouthful, but it's gut underscore health underscore clinic underscore Black Rock. And um, I post um, on these kind of topics as much as I can just to try and um, up against all the misinformation that's out there but um yeah pleasure fantastic to well it's been great to have you on folks if you are interested in gut health give lorraine a follow on instagram you've heard the content here it's very straightforward it's no nonsense and it's all backed up by studies and that's what's most important when it comes to gut health as ever you know where we are we're real health at independent.ie at carl henry pt on twitter and on instagram have an amazing week eat lots of very food 30 is your magic number over the course of the next seven days give that a go as a challenge and we'll see you next week for more real health Leia Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry.